SCP-001, Amani Ram, Part 1 The Church of the Broken God is one of the most popular and expansive groups of interest in the SCP universe, a religion that worships a broken, mechanical deity and wish to rebuild it by bringing together its anomalous parts. The Church's origins lie in a similar group known as the Mechanites that date back to ancient times, and their conflicts with other notable groups at the time, the Sarkites and the Davites. This SCP-001 proposal takes a fresh look at the Mechanites and these conflicts, in a canon in which this is the first time that the Foundation is learning of them. It's a big, mysterious city, and it's going to take some time to disassemble it. So let's begin. SCP-001 is an extra-dimensional bubble of self-contained reality located in the southern Arabian desert. It's inaccessible to anyone that does not have prior knowledge of its location, meaning that an individual has to have exact knowledge of its geographical position to reach it. Notably, individuals with some sort of artificial implant, from surgical screws to complex prosthetics, appear to have a higher chance in locating and entering the anomaly, with testing showing a success rate of 88% compared to standard personnel's 62%. The reality bubble contains an ancient metropolis partially buried in the sand, with maps and initial sonar testing indicating approximately two-thirds of the city is above ground and largely intact, while the subterranean portion has degraded heavily. The above-ground city contains skyscrapers and buildings up to half a kilometer high, utilizing modern design techniques far beyond those available at the time of construction, dated around 2400 BCE. The buildings are fully furnished, and appear to have served residential, commercial, bureaucratic, and various other uses, with the largest and most intricate being a temple structure in the center of the city. The buildings also contain artistic works and large bas-reliefs depicting a variety of scenes ranging from apparently religious stories to historical events. These contain writing in an unknown language containing elements of Old Arabic, and most of them are concentrated in the temple structure. The subterranean floors are dominated by extensive, complex machinery, ranging from antiquated clockwork systems to vacuum tubes to power generators extremely similar to modern nuclear reactors. All of the machinery is non-functional, however, and appears to be in a state of advanced disrepair. There are no living organisms within the city, but there are a number of automata, or robots, led by one of them that has identified the city as being the origin of the myth of Iram of the Pillars, but its proper name is Amani Ram. Iram is referenced in the Quran, quoted as Iram, who had lofty pillars, the likes of whom had never been created in the lands. It was referenced as a culture subject to divine retribution by God for their oppression of others. Many theories have been offered on the identity or location of the group or city identified as Iram, but nothing has ever been confirmed by the wider historical community. A money ROM first came to the Foundation's attention in 1983, after the containment of SCP-1867, the beloved explorer and naturalist Lord Theodore Thomas Blackwood. Some of his journals recovered from his private vault detail his experiences with the French Armée d'Orion during their campaign into the Middle East in 1801. One journal partially dictated an encounter he had with a vast, ruined city accessible only to those who knew its location, which is a tale I've read elsewhere on this channel. An interview was conducted with Blackwood for further information. Blackwood is interviewed by a female doctor, and he begins by saying that it's heartening to see someone of the gentler sex in such an academic position, and that it warms the cockles of his heart. The doctor quickly moves on, 
telling him that she wants to discuss the journal titled Lord Blackwood in the First Cities of Man. Blackwood recalls it, but isn't sure why there'd be questions, as he remembers being very thorough. Unfortunately, water damage has left most of it illegible. I'll proceed with reading the section from Blackwood's journal verbatim. July 12th, 1801. I have received the most peculiar gift today. Messer Brazo visited me today, simply appearing out of nowhere in front of my breakfast table and pulling out a chair. After umpteen years of knowing Jacques, this is not altogether surprising, but the timing of the visit did inspire a measure of surprise in me, though he refused to answer any questions until Miss Cartwright served him a plate, the cad. He confirmed, at my slightly offended prodding, that his recent silence had come as a result of increased scrutiny on the value of Le Estate Noir by the First Consul Bonaparte. Whether the francs being poured into their archives were not better spent equipping the men on the front. Whether the objects in such archives could not be put to better use on the very same fronts. An officer communicating with an English noble during wartime would be a death knell for the organization. While I care little for mundane political squabbles, I understand Jacques' position. My second question was regarding the large, hay-packed crate that had appeared alongside Jacques. Wiping his mouth from the pheasant, he explained it was a gift, and drew his cavalry saber to use the flat to pry off the top of the crate. We both peered in. A collection of six large, heavy stone tablets, each the size of my chest, packed with straw into neat rows. Using all our strength, we were able to draw one out. It was papered in inscriptions and an obtuse script that resembled Greek. Jacques explained over coffee some time later. Due to the increased scrutiny on the estate, he had taken it upon himself to personally ensure no potentially dangerous artifacts made it into the hands of the Warhawks in the French consulate. He had been surreptitiously smuggling such items out of catacombs and into the hands of well-informed friends of ours. I questioned what kind of danger a set of tablets could carry. He elucidated. Some years ago, agents of the estate recovered a cache of technology, impossibly advanced prostheses, from a shipwreck in the Aegean Sea. With them had come this set of tablets, remarkably well-preserved in sealed jars. They apparently described a set of ancient cultures, the origins of the technology, and where to find their cities. Deeply intriguing, but the translations were ongoing in Paris. He promised to deliver the manuscripts as soon as they were complete, and so I await. Several weeks' worth of entries have been rendered illegible by moisture damage. August 23rd, 1801. Traveling with soldiers always makes for an entertaining trip, if nothing else. When Brazil first provided me the completed translations, I was slightly incredulous. The Arabia has been inhabited continuously for many centuries by a surprisingly cultured people. Surely, if a metropolis to this scale laid in the center of the area, someone would have found it. But then, the Black Tower lies beneath London herself, and I was the first man in centuries to step through its doors. I suppose anything is possible. I could tell Jacques would have preferred to go himself, but the good Frenchman urged me instead. With the tenuous political situation in the consulate, he could not afford to go on an expedition. Unfettered as I was by antiquated political rulings, he arranged for my passage with the Armée d'Orient as they moved into Egypt and Arabia. I found myself agreeing along. It has been some years since I had traveled to the warmth of the equator. And so here I remain my detachment of just over two dozen sleeping in a distanced camp. At first, the soldiers were naturally suspicious of Englishmen, especially in times like these, but we are all too weary to keep up such walls for long. Now my two dozen men mingle with them like brothers, conversing in a broken mixture of French and English. 
They are all too willing to listen to our stories of the paranatural. The Encore trails and the Sphinx hunts have become favorites. The officers, however, remain wary of the Englishmen with the strange tools and charms and stories of a world beyond. No matter. Tonight is the last night we bunk with the Armée. Tomorrow the marching plans take us as close as they ever will to the location transcribed on the tablets, less than a day's walk. Diverting the entire army is beyond even Messer Brazo, so my detachment will say our goodbyes to our traveling companions and walk the distance. Tomorrow we see what truth there is to these legends of an Atlantis of the Sands. August 24th, 1801. Pardon my French, but bollocks. August 24th, 1801. Continued. This expanse of sand is no different from the other countless expanses of sand we have traveled to arrive here. Empty, desolate, not even birds of prey ride these winds. It is dark, but even in the darkness it is quite obvious there is nothing here resembling an Atlantis of the sands, resembling much of anything at all, in fact. Merely the rolling dunes. We have chosen to make camp. I write this by lantern light as the men eat and make merry. We will continue searching in the morning, but the immediate signifiers are not reassuring. August 25th, 1801. My predictions from last night ring true. We have combed every square meter of the location in the tablets, explicitly marked as the midpoint between the mountains and at an angle to a crevasse, which we located. By all possible measures, the city should be here. The men have come to the conclusion that we are indeed in the correct location, but at the incorrect elevation. Toying with his false eye at supper time, Watterson posited that after 3,000 years, the strong wind patterns in the Arabian Peninsula would likely have shifted large amounts of sand. Aman Iram may well be here, simply buried under countless tons of sand. Not a reassuring notion, but better than it not existing at all, though the latter is just as likely. Tomorrow we begin digging. August 26th, 1801. Watterson has vanished from the dig site. The men sustain he was directing them one moment took a step away for a smoke, and vanished from thin air. We have searched up and down the area. I fear the worst. August 26th, 1801. Continued. Relief. We heard loud calls during a silent supper and raced out of the tent. We found Watterson stumbling across the sand, out of his mind with thirst and sunstroke. We filled him with water and carried him back to camp. He is resting in a tent, and the surgeon says he will be fine in the morning. Off his body fell his own journal, the most recent entry, dated to today, being a hastily scribbled statement on how he had fallen into an ancient city, in a space that seemed separate from the surrounding desert. This warrants investigation. Several pages of moisture damage. August 27th, 1801. I have traveled up and down the earth, exploring the peaks and crevasses of our wondrous planet. The things I have seen have filled countless volumes and vaults in Britannia. I have encountered forgotten beasts, forsaken lands, and more than my fair share of ancient ruins. I have never seen anything like Iram. Iram. Amman is, according to the tablets, a title akin to capital, is an impressive sight by any mundane measure. Its walls outclass their Chinese rival in thickness and height, more battlements than blockade. The streets are wide and open, crisscrossing the city into a complex web of roads and avenues. The broadways are lined with what could have once been shops and merchant stalls. The towers. 
By Jove, the towers stretch so far into the sky, one struggles to imagine how they could have been constructed. The intricate stone and metal work that covers every surface has the telltale imperfections of hand carving. The city itself is not in our world, not properly. It exists in a sort of pocket, accessible at random. I am as yet unsure what qualifies one for being able to access this pocket, but once a person is seen doing this, it appears all others around them are also capable of it. Most curious. The city is truly gargantuan, much larger than even London, and we have seen passages underground. I expect some sort of underground construction. But it is impossible for us to explore the entirety, so we have chosen to make camp in one of the empty buildings for the night. An air of excitement buzzes through the air as we eat and bed down. August 28th, 1801. Further exploration has indicated the city is perhaps not as utopian as first thought. The first task was to ascertain a rough map of the city. A large portion of it is, as we discovered, almost totally destroyed. Bombed out ruins, pitted streets, and dried out bones litter the paths. Scorch marks on the buildings complete the image. The section of the wall in this quarter is similarly broken through. I am of the opinion that this city did not fall apart. It was taken. Whatever battle did occur here, it was three millennia ago, and yet the bones look as clean and fresh as if they had been stripped, not yesterday. The men we sent into the passages quickly returned, with claims of strange vines and pods down below, in a labyrinth of iron and steel. These are hardened men who have explored with me many times, but they seemed unnerved. I will go down myself, but today was consumed by the making of the map. The city itself is approximately circular. A temple complex dominates the center, and four broadways extending outward cut the arrangement into quarters. Very well designed for an era in which mathematics was only a loose concept. But there is a soberness. The emptiness of this city is overwhelming. Not only have we seen no other people, we have not seen farms, plants, animals, anything remotely resembling life. The howl of the wind is the only sound one can hear, aside from his own boots against the stone. This effect is only intensified at night. As we settle down into our tents, we do not speak. There is an unspeakable presence in the air. August 29th, 1801 As I turned to make my way back to the camp, I heard a soft pinging, the unmistakable sound of metal on stone. I raised my cane, only to see a small metal automaton, a child's toy, staring back at me. A monkey that could fit into the palm of my hand, hanging from a pipe along a wall. It cocked its head at me, a moment of hesitation, and then I reached out. I have no idea what it is. I've seen automata, but this metal beast is intelligent, capable of acting depending on the situation. It shows emotion. It plays when I play and hides when I shout. Most fascinating. This is, no doubt, an example of the aforementioned advanced technology that led us here. I brought it to the camp and the men were similarly fascinated. I assumed this creature, watching us, was the source of the strange heaviness last night. A seasoned explorer can always tell when there are a pair of eyes on his back, even when he cannot see them. But when I bunk, I hear it, in the very farthest reaches of my hearing, countless overlapping pitter-patters of metal on stone. 
We are far from alone. August 30th, 1801. I visited the temple today. It is a grand affair, like the stone-carved temples of the New World. Sandstone and limestone, with great big murals fashioned out of overlapping plates of a strange bronze metal. They are incredibly stylized, but seem to tell a story, possibly a creation myth of savages, but I find it difficult to say. A massive statue of what could only be a god or king dominates the courtyard, hefting a spear and sword. His gaze seems to follow me throughout the temple. If it is indeed a temple, the interior can only be described as a throne room, and what a throne, rivaling even King Edward's chair. I hold my ear close, and I swear I can hear a slight ticking. Standing in its presence is strange, invasive, I would say. I did not dwell, and I warned my men to do the same. I do not know what is within that throne, but every instinct in my body suggests I should leave it be. August 31st, 1801. I descended into the passages today. The men were right. The silence above ground is doubled down below. Every movement and step against the metal sends an echoing clang through the structure, as if I were standing at the bottom of a canyon. I left a rope to mark my path. Before long, the maze became utterly impossible to navigate by memory. Surely they would never intentionally create something this labyrinthine. Or perhaps they had their own methods of mapping the path. Regardless, I am not bold enough to risk disorientation in pitch blackness and return quickly. But before I did, I stumbled upon the vines mentioned by the men. Petrified little things, snaking up and down the walls and falling to ash when touched with my blade. The pods. Spherical things resting on the vines, the size of my chest, slightly throbbing. And the bones. Hundreds on hundreds, human and otherwise. Deformed skulls. Femurs with bulbous growths, bones splitting into Y-shaped crosses, a chain of small bones four meters long, and countless human bones picked clean of all viscera. They are littered knee-deep and dry as, well, a bone. They crunch underneath my boot. These charnel houses start as jarringly as they stop, Entire passageways can be ossuaries, and other sections are all fine steel and rusted iron. I do not know what occurred here, but whatever it is, it was something horrible. Tomorrow we take our leave and go to our ship docked in the Levant to report back to the estate. Aman Iram is seductive, but my own bones tell me that if I do not take my leave quickly, they will join their countless brethren under the streets. Thanks to Blackwood, the Foundation was able to recover the six tablets, with translations ongoing due to the extremely specific dialect of ancient Greek used. One of his journal pages, however, contains a translation of the front of the first tablet. It reads, In the beginning, there were three. A thousand years before, before man learned of Olympus, before the extinction of the giants, before the sea had full regressed, there were three. Three great cities dividing the world tripartite. Mamjul and Korar, two dark fortresses resting in the jungles of the subcontinent. The magicians and sorcerer Nawabs allied themselves against the horrors of the jungle and crossed a pact with something ancient. The covenant of the Deva was born, using the first magic gifted to man, the magic of life, 
and death. Aditum, a city thrown into rebellion by a charismatic slave turned lay preacher who promised wealth, freedom, and power to those that would help him. Together they threw off their yokes, slaughtered their oppressors with their new sorcery, and rebuilt their collapsed city, all under the name of the Grand Carcist Ion. The Nalka Empire freed the second magic, Carnomancy, the magic of flesh. Amani Ram, first great Ram of the Mechanite Empire as it spread like a wildfire from the deserts. A gleaming, shining metropolis rising out of the dunes, a center of knowledge, science, understanding that the world had never seen. The magic of machines became known, the fervor for a new god that sought to uplift men, not subjugate them. A thousand years before, the three great nations of men fought a war that destroyed the world. The tablets go on to clarify that Amani Ram was ruled by a theocratic cult in the area, referred to as the Mechanite Cult, or the Cult of the Broken God. No other evidence for this group had been discovered thus far. An MTF, Sigma-3 Magellan Men, was sent in to investigate the reality bubble and gain access to the city, if possible. They set their helicopters down a distance from the coordinates and began walking towards the location. As they closed in, they began to spread out to try and locate the bubble, but after several minutes were unsuccessful. Suddenly, one of the team's biometrics disappears, and it turns out that they had entered the reality bubble without realizing. The rest of the team enters, maintaining radio contact on the other side. Several hundred meters ahead of them is a massive glass and metal city, with skyscrapers hundreds of meters tall. The team briefly comments on the city's beauty before progressing in. They note that the larger skyscrapers are made of a bronze-colored metal and polished glass, while the smaller buildings seem to be constructed from a blend of limestone bricks and concrete. They all exhibit an architectural style reminiscent of Islamic and Moroccan architecture, with the streets appearing to have designated sections for pedestrians and larger traffic. The team discusses this, commenting that possibly the inhabitants had some sort of anomalous cars. All of the homes are fully furnished, and look as if everyone got up and left partway through dinner. One of the team hears something like a rat, but none of the others do, so they continue on. They find some large stairways leading underground, but decide not to travel down there without the mole rats MTF present. Eventually they come to a heavily deteriorated section of the city, with entire sections of buildings having exploded and left to the elements. Here they find a deep hole in the ground, with a large pile of skeletons at the bottom. The team leader surmises that this was a mass grave, and they see one of the vines that Lord Blackwood mentioned at the bottom. They decide not to go down for a sample, as there are likely others elsewhere. Continuing on, they find many more similar mass graves, and they come up to the temple complex in the center of the city. The team comments on the grandeur of the location, despite it being only a few stories high, and they proceed to enter. The interior is an open-air courtyard, with a central 30-meter statue of a man sitting on a throne. The man's face is obscured by an intricate mask, and his robes fall away to reveal a torso made of metal plating. They continue on into a central court area, featuring an oversized throne, inset with gears and swords on the opposite end. The interior of the place is vast, and the team spends an hour exploring its various staterooms, kitchens, and bathrooms. The team decides that it's getting late and they should leave, but one of the members turns to the wall and tells something that it's okay for it to come out, 
as they won't hurt it. A metallic skittering is heard coming from the pipes along the wall, causing the rest of the team to draw their sidearms. A metallic automaton, resembling a horseshoe crab, then gingerly peeks out of a hole in a pipe, slowly approaching and climbing onto the member's outstretched arm. Command tells the team that it doesn't seem to be dangerous, so they shouldn't shoot it, but don't let their guard down. The team lead is about to say that at least there's only one of them, but then a louder skittering sound becomes audible as a great number of automatons varying in shape start peering out from various pipes. The team quickly left the city, and were not pursued by any entities. On their way out, they noted many automata milling about the city and traversing through the city's pipe system. They expressed no hostility, and several approached to investigate, although none followed past the borders of the city. The O5 Council decided to establish a long-term research outpost inside of the city after several expeditions proved that the mechanical entities were not hostile to humans. Forty-three researchers were flown in from various sites and departments, primarily specializing in archaeology, history, both mundane and anomalous, and paratechnology, along with a fifteen-man tactical response team. Since augmented personnel were relatively common with the Foundation at this time, Individuals with complex prosthetics, bionics, and implants were favored due to the unexplained connection these augments have with the city. Two co-leads were selected for the project, Dr. Robert Aram and Dr. Hedvig Nussbaum. Aram is a senior researcher in the paratechnology department and special consultant on anomalous robotics, with a PhD in Thaw Mechatronics. He was previously consulting on anomalous technology recovered from Prometheus Labs, after being a former employee of the company that left over a salary dispute. He distinguished himself after being recruited by the Foundation with superior, prodigal knowledge and skill in handling paratechnology. He has also had his left arm and leg amputated following a laboratory accident at Prometheus which had been replaced with high-quality anomalous prosthetics. Nussbaum is a researcher with the Parahistory Division, and a special consultant on anomalous cults and cultures, with a PhD in archaeology. Her previous assignment was cataloging anomalous objects recovered in the possession of Lord Blackwood. She was recruited to the Foundation straight out of graduate school, eventually becoming a full researcher after discovering a complex of anomalous ruins in Sub-Saharan Africa. She possesses a non-invasive ocular implant that allows for hands-free visual communication and overlay, as well as general access to Foundation databases. The temple complex in the center of the city was used as the base for the research center, and the mechanical entities were initially intrigued by the new arrivals before losing interest shortly thereafter. The researchers were divided into two groups, an engineering team led by Dr. Aram to investigate the technology of the city and the mechanical entities, and an anthropological team led by Dr. Nussbaum to investigate the history, culture, and ultimate fate of the Mechanite Empire. A general directive was given to the entire team to avoid the subterranean portions of the city until a detachment from the Mole Rats could arrive to map it out. Both Doctors Aram and Nussbaum submit some general statements on the progress of their research. Aram's reads, I've encountered many strange, unique things over my career at Prometheus and the Foundation. But I can firmly state that I've never seen anything quite as magical as a money rom. So far, we've only been able to investigate the machinery on the surface city. I'm told the real treasure is under the streets, but obviously we can't explore that right now. Which appears to be largely concentrated in the upper floors of the skyscrapers, though 
I think calling them skyscrapers is an understatement. Each is about 500 meters, a little taller than Sears Tower. A marvel of engineering in and of itself, but not an obviously anomalous one. What they contain, however, is a different story. For my layman's perspective, they appear to be combination residential, office, and bureaucratic buildings. Each floor seems to consign itself to one of those three types and contains appropriate pieces of technology. Most are too degraded to be useful, but the fact that they're there at all after thousands of years is incredible. I can discern the purposes of about a quarter of them, though. They're all anomalous to some extent. The drones are writing up detailed reports now, but they variously break laws of thermodynamics, physics, and matter conservation, and often simply use magic to do things as mundane as copy documents or keep food hot or cold. And of course, the automata. Little machines made of a golden metal and built to resemble animals that this culture in the middle of the desert could have no possible way of knowing about. Definitely sentient, possibly sapient, fully mechanical. I found a broken open one on the street and took it as a sample, picture attached. But demonstrating what looks to me like primitive artificial intelligence. There must be hundreds of them, at least. My guess is that they were designed to maintain the city and for the millennia it's lain abandoned, they've been doing exactly that. They're pretty cute, to be honest. Whatever this civilization was, the Anomalous was so pedestrian to them, they were using paratechnology we even now barely understand as household appliances and servants. They were playing with nuclear reactors while the rest of us huddled in caves behind the fire. If this is any indicator of what lies below the streets, a money rom might be the key to pushing humanity into the future. Nussbaum's report reads, I have to continually pinch myself to make sure I'm not dreaming. A vast city, undocumented by anyone else in the modern era, hiding a culture that had blended advanced magic and technology to settle half of Asia, while the Egyptians had yet to settle the Nile. If the evidence wasn't surrounding me, I'd call myself a liar. We've already discovered much. Some of the researchers are more interested in investigating the individual houses and homes to see what an average citizen lived like. Completely understandable. That said, I'm far more intrigued by this cult of Mekane that seems to pervade every aspect of Amani Ram. In the ruins of Sumer and other ancient cities, religious iconography is common. Here, it's ubiquitous. The palace temple is the most obvious example of this, with mechanical bas-reliefs that seem to tell a creation myth laid throughout. The buildings, houses, shops, skyscrapers, even the machinery Robert's team is disassembling have this religious significance about them. It's especially fascinating since practically nothing else is known to us about the religion or culture of these mechanites beyond the admittedly questionable statements of Lord Blackwood. Even the name mechanite is a Greek epithet used in the Aegean tablets, derivative of Mechane, machine. As it stands, their culture is a black box, and even with the murals and writings, I doubt we will ever have more than a passing understanding of this once great civilization and what happened to them. Obviously, we know plenty about the Mechanites and the Church of the Broken God, but keep in mind that this is a different canon, where this is the first the Foundation has ever heard of them. The detachment of the Mole Rats does eventually arrive in the city, and prepares to make their descent into the subterranean portions, equipped with devices that use high-frequency echoing sound waves to construct maps of subterranean areas. 
They descend down some fancy-looking stairs, possibly made of marble, indicating that they're likely not entering an industrial area. At the bottom of the stairs, 25 meters below ground, they enter into a stone corridor, with pipes running in every direction. The corridor is wide enough to comfortably fit all of them, and they note that there's some non-functional lights on the walls. Eventually they enter into some sort of foundry, a huge room with lots of big machinery and assembly lines. Most of the machinery looks trashed though, so they take some photos and continue on down a descending corridor. The air quality begins to grow worse, and the mole rats suggest gas masks if anyone is going to be heading down here. They're interrupted by a noise coming from the pipes, and the team lead tells them to take their safeties off, as they don't trust those crab things. They continue into a workshop of some sort, with desks and what looks like what was once paper. They pass through a number of similar looking rooms and storage closets before passing into a hallway made of metallic pipes. Suddenly, one of the team exclaims in pain and says that their implant is acting wonky. Another member says that the same thing is happening to theirs, and they had asked the researchers about it who said that the city has some sort of weird relationship with tech and they're working on figuring it out. Part of the corridor then collapses, nearly causing one of the team to slip and fall. The section falls into the abyss below, landing with a splash. They tell Command that they've discovered the sewers, and complain about the stench. It seems that the underground was for maintenance of the city, but it hasn't aged as well as the above ground portions. The team proceeds to continue to explore for the next hour, mapping out the underground, finally coming across an area overgrown with black vines. One of the team goes to take a sample, but at his touch, the entire vine crumbles into a fine black dust. They then see, pinned against the concrete by the vines, is a human skeleton, with several vines jutting through the ribs and into the concrete. After that, they find a pod, roughly a square meter in size, sitting on a stalk. One of the team gives it a jab with his rifle, causing it to rupture and leak out a foul-smelling black liquid that dissolves the vine it comes into contact with. A highly decomposed corpse rolls out, just as it did with Lord Blackwood. Continuing on, they find more victims pinned to the walls, and more mass graves. One of the team notes that the walls are all covering machinery, as they can see parts through the cracks in the metal. It's possible that the entire Undercity is a machine. They are then interrupted by another clanging sound throughout the pipe system, but this one is considerably closer. They raise their firearms, and a few seconds later, a machine shaped like a small monkey emerges from the pipes, moving past the team. At the corner of the corridor, it turns to look at them. They decide that it must want them to follow it, so they do so. They follow it for 35 minutes as it leads them deeper underground and through the facility, over large abysses and through rooms of large complex machinery and displays. Eventually it stops as they enter a cavernous room containing a single large object at its far end, with their location marked as being directly under the temple complex in the center of the city. The object is a massive block of metal, covered in gears, displays, circuitry, and vacuum tubes extending throughout the room to more machinery arranged along the walls. At the front of this block is a vaguely humanoid figure jutting outwards, hanging like a figurehead. A human head, arm, and upper chest are placed on a mostly mechanical frame and it looks upward as the team approaches with their guns raised. It opens its mouth and a stilted, feminine voice with a digital edge booms out. 
The voice says that they have entered the gate of the West, Adatum's answer, the great and holy city of Amani Ram. It welcomes them and says that there is much to discuss. Further questions from the team were either rebuffed or met with nonsensical statements, with it repeatedly expressing the desire to speak with the scholars, which they interpreted to mean Drs. Aram and Nussbaum. They spent the following hours mapping a path back to the surface, and after returning, researchers used the collected data to construct a 3D rendering of a significant portion of Amani Ram's undercity. The Mole Rats declared that the Undercity was largely safe for exploration, barring particularly heavily corroded passages and areas infested by the vines and pods. Subsequent analysis of the pods determined that their exterior skin is an organic but calcified substance similar to flesh. Both Aram and Nussbaum agreed to conduct an interview with the entity underground and they were escorted by a team of tactical response officers the following day. As they enter the chamber and find the figure hanging limply from the wall, Aram's first question is if it's alive. The entity's head twitches upwards and says no, and then welcomes them. His second question is what it is, to which it responds that it is, it was, and it remains and then asks them what they are. Nussbaum says that they are scholars, here to investigate the city and its history. This causes the entity's head to go limp once again, followed by a flurry of mechanical activity in the wall behind it before it raises its head again. It then tells them that the grand, great city of Amani Ram is home to four academies, sixteen schools, and scores of scholars and learned men, discovering, working, and blending the gifts of God. It asks what gives them the right to call themselves scholars. Nussbaum responds that anyone who seeks knowledge can call themselves a scholar and they haven't seen anyone else since they've arrived. The entity reveals that it knows exactly when they arrived, as it has been observing them thanks to the automata around the city, which are scholars, servants, soldiers, and everything else. It has subsequently learned their language from observing the Foundation troops. It accuses them of coming to conquer the city, but Nussbaum assures it that that is not the case. The entity says that they walk in here with guards, and only generals, kings, and priests require guards. Since they claim to not be generals, they must be a king and queen. Aram asks why they couldn't be priests, but the entity says that it is a priest, and it can smell that they have no shred of God in their hearts. Aram then says that yes, he supposes that they are the leaders of their people. The entity then formally welcomes them to the second spire, white city of the broken empire, finger of Mekain, the Fulad throne, the great and holy city of Amani Ram. Nussbaum asks it to explain what exactly all that means, and the entity asks how long they have been unaware of the city's history. She says that she's not sure, but thousands of years at the minimum, and they didn't think anyone would still be alive. The entity goes limp again for a moment before stating that it is not alive, but it is the kiss of God, shining steel and fulad, made in Mekane's image, and they are everything it is not. It then suddenly asks to see Aram's prosthetic arm sending one of the small automatons to examine it. Afterwards, it says that Amani Ram was a city of science and blessing, Mekane's gift to them that allowed them to construct wonderful things. Every man, woman, and child were given augmentations like Aram's arm to become something better than human. Aram tells it that the vast majority of the personnel here have some form of augment. 
The entity says that they are allowed entry to the city, and it will assist them in recording their history and its creations, so as to make sure they are not forgotten. It has not been repaired in many revolutions, leaving gaps in its memory, but the temple contains an inexorable record of the city's godly creation, and it will translate it for them. Nussbaum thanks it and says that they are in its debt, but the entity responds that a fair bargain has been struck, with it showing them the history of the city and them preserving the Mechanite Empire. It then proceeded to give them a number of documents, including a basic translation guide for the city's language, coined Mechanite, to English, with some Greek bywords. They were also given a map of the Undercity, fully annotated, full schematics of various technologies found within the city, and a small mechanical device of unknown function. With all this, the proper study of the city could begin. The temple courtyard contains a number of intricate murals, with Nussbaum believing them to be the Mechanite creation myth. The first shows a scene of three figures wrestling in a dark void, followed by the figures falling to different corners of a slightly inaccurate map of Asia. One of the figures dominates the rest of the scenes, revealed to be a massive but lithe figure dressed in golden armor. A shepherd, his wife, and his three lame sheep happen upon it buried in the sand, obviously wounded. The plaque underneath reads, Before the new pantheon, before the smoke and the singing, the old gods fought their war over nothing. They wounded each other and fell, twisting and writhing to the lowest world. Mekain blessed be her name, alighted in the far west under the scorching gaze of the sun. She rested in the dunes, uncovered by the flock of a shepherd, Bumaro. The second mural shows the god reaching out and touching the shepherd and his wife, causing the shepherd's missing leg to be replaced with a metal limb, and his shepherd's crook to be replaced with a spear. His wife's eyes glow gold, and large metal wings spring from her back. The sheep are armored over to resemble the automata in the city, and together they attempt to raise the god from the sand. The plaque underneath reads, Mekane drew forth her touch and raised them. Bumaro's lame leg replaced by a greave. Hadara's sight restored, and all given the form of the angels. Grateful, they sought to raise their new god from her tomb, and they failed. The last mural shows the god digging deeper, lying face down in the sand. It looks up at the shepherd and strips the armor from its massive fist, which the shepherd takes and melts down, reforging it into a suit of armor in the image of the god, and a massive throne. He returns to his village, where the people naturally submit to him. Many of them are disabled and lacking limbs, but when they return to the resting place of the god, all are given mechanical augments. They rejoice and use more of the stripped armor to construct a shining city on the god's back. The plaque underneath reads, She knew that the wound was not mortal, but crippling. She understood her fate, and entrusted her legacy to Bamaro and his blood. He became the first blacksmith, shaping the metal of her body as she shaped life itself. He made himself in her image, and the people were awed. For their faith, they were uplifted beyond the chains of humanity and from her stripped armor they raised the first city on the back of the sleeping goddess, Amani-Ram, city of Fulad, shining gate of the west. Meanwhile, hundreds of pieces of technology were analyzed and investigated by the engineering team, 
although many were too degraded to be of any practical use. We're provided a handful of descriptions of some of the notable discoveries. The first are four meter poles inset into the ground at various intervals through the streets of Amani Ram. Each pole is topped with six disc shaped objects, a meter wide, and when an electrical current is applied to the pole, the discs begin to knock against each other, emitting radio waves of unclear purpose. It's currently theorized to be some sort of conductor system for the city, possibly to create a free, wireless power system. Another set of objects are large, partially subterranean greenhouses, occupying a significant portion of the western district of the city. Underground copper pipes can cool and heat the greenhouses according to valves, and the greenhouses are several floors tall, utilizing novel organization and irrigation techniques. It's likely that a large portion of the city's theorized half a million population could have been fed thanks to these buildings. A third set is a series of magnetically charged rails running through the city in a loop, though all the rail cars have been completely ruined. Applying a specific electrical charge allows rapid, high-speed movement through the city, with it believed to have been a hop-on, hop-off method of mass transit at extraordinarily low overhead. The fourth are small metal shields with two switches on the handle, which, when fully powered, causes either the projection of a rapidly oscillating energy shield or a skin-tight shield that effectively renders the wearer invisible. The fifth are large constructs, with two in every district, inside of which are large machines containing radioactive material. The engineering team is of the opinion that these could have been functional nuclear or possibly cold fusion reactors, supplying electricity to the city's power grid. The sixth is not entirely clear, but the engineering team believes that a significant portion of the undercity appears to be one gargantuan machine, incorporating both mundane technology and paratechnology. During the process of research and excavation, some of the automata led the archaeological team to a structure in the southern district that appeared to be some sort of library or university. The metal and clay tablets found inside were remarkably well preserved, and in the basement was a large metal safe, rusted off its hinges. Within was a cache of several dozen metal cylinders measuring 10 centimeters in diameter, imprinted with meconite writing. We're given the translation of one of these, which reads, And the shining eye of the empire rose as Bumaro took his anointed seat on the Fulad throne. A money Ram rose from the sands on the back of Mekain, her pieces scattered to the six winds and the five corners of the world. As the slaves marched on Aditum in the east, and the covenants were struck in the south, so too was the holiest and the godliest of magics given freely to man under the watchful eye of the sun. And the sword of Mekain cut a swath through the world, and all those trembled in fear until they saw the light of the Ram, the greatest city of man, gifted by Mekain, but built by the hands of the workers, not the demons of the covenant or the flesh slaves. The empire swelled, and the metal road ferried new people, and a money rom swelled from their presence. And the world was good, as Bumara watched from his throne for his reign of centuries. And when his reign ended, and his golden body passed, the Empress Hadara wept, and the city of a money rom wept with her and they rested their hope onto the air. And Hashir Bumaro grew into a wise king under the auspices of his family, and gave his arm and his leg for his empire, just as his father had done. And in that way Bumaro lived on, resting in the soul of his son, and his son's son, and so on forevermore. 
and the Emperor Bumaro used the throne to invoke the wisdom of his past lives, and in that way the Empire conquered and slew its way into the world, and it was led into the continent and into the conflict with the other nations of man, bloody and brutal. Devastation After several months of research, another interview was held with the mechanical entity underneath the city to ask some more questions. Aram and Nussbaum are joined by some other researchers, and the entity asks about them, wondering if they are their attendants. Aram says that they are, to simplify things, and the entity says that it will answer their questions. Nussbaum asks for the entity's name first and it says that they may call it Preserver, as that is its function. One researcher asks about the strange bronze alloy that they keep finding throughout the city, which has proven to be too hard to take samples of. Preserver says that this is the Fulad, a gift from Mekain that they used to forge their swords, their technology, and their very way of life. It is the backbone that the Empire was built on, as it's a sign of favor from God that they were the chosen people. Every citizen was expected to know how to work and melt it, as they were a nation of swordsmen and foundries. The Fulad throne was a throne crafted by Wumaro from the first ingots of the metal, stripped from the armor of Mekain herself. It is holy beyond holiness, divine beyond divinity. Its very presence is a symbol of power, but now it sits empty in the throne room. Preserver says that it will teach them how to work the Fulad, and they should bear it well, as it was among the greatest boons gifted to their culture. They move on to asking about Bumaro, who seems to be a central figure here. Preserver says that Emperor Bumaro was the first mortal man to witness the majesty of the Broken God in all her glory. The researchers recall this from the creation myth, but Preserver says that it's not a myth, but history, and Bumaro reigned for centuries, with his bloodline raising the greatest army ever known, all to bring order and justice to the world. They next ask about the other nations of man mentioned in various texts, and if they were related to the fall of the city. Preserver pauses and then simply says that it doesn't know. Sometime later, Aram and Nussbaum had a remote meeting with 0511 to discuss their findings. The meeting takes place utilizing a virtual projection powered by the ley lines of the earth resembling a small asphalt parking lot in what appears to be the American Southwest. Aram says that he helped design it, and it costs a fortune to run, but 0511 says that thanks to the recent improvements that have come out of a money ROM, it now only costs a small fortune to run. Nussbaum says that they're in the process of translating the hundreds of tablets, engravings, and mosaics across the city. The vast majority are simple day-to-day -day affairs, all of which paint the Mechanite culture as a society that was building a metropolis of the future while the glaciers from the Ice Age were still melting. 0511 says that that's all fascinating, but he wonders if they've figured out any of the city's later history, and what exactly caused the downfall of the most technologically advanced culture in the world at the time. He also wants to know more about these other nations mentioned, the Nalka Empire and the Davite Covenant, as they must have been powerful enough to war with the Mechanites, and possibly defeat them. The research hasn't really pointed at much relating to specific locations of their capital cities, and they're still not sure how the city died. 0511 guesses that the vines and pods found beneath the city are related, and Nussbaum agrees that that's quite likely. 0511 then asks about Preserver, telling them that it's hiding something from them, 
and asks how they had artificial intelligence when the Persians were figuring out irrigation. Aram says that that's far from their only breakthrough, and if the Foundation could harness their cold fusion technology, their bionics, their power systems, any one of them could change the world. 0511 isn't so sure, as for all they know, their technology led to their downfall. He is willing to continue to supply Aram and Nussbaum with whatever they need to continue their research, however. When Aram says that they believe they'll need 200 additional personnel, though, 0511 says that that's not quite something he can make happen with a snap of his fingers, but they'll have them within two months. Aram then asks for permission to see if they can't get certain aspects of the city working again, such as the power grid. They think they could get it back online within the month with Preserver's help, and it would help them learn more about the machinery. 0511 hesitates, but grants the permission, telling them to stay safe, as they're working blind here. The additional personnel and requisitions arrived some time later, necessitating the expansion of their research base into another skyscraper in the city's southern district. The disused rail system was brought back online to connect the two sites, which necessitated bringing the power grid and reactors back online, using technical assistance from Preserver and its automatons. The first two reactors that were brought online provided power to the entire western and southern districts of the city, allowing the usage of lighting, air conditioning, and of the rail system. Aram and Nussbaum return to Preserver afterwards, prompting it to remark that they are repairing its city. It also notes that there are a lot more people here now, settling into the ruins, and they are permitted to do so as they are assisting its city. Nussbaum then asks for some more information about the city's history, asking if it remembers anything about the end of the Empire. It pauses and says that it does not have the answers they seek, as its memory is fragmented. It remembers little more than hazes and flashes, images of sitting at the market and waiting for its mother, playing with other children, and crying as its brother fixed the welds and screws on its leg. Aram surmises that Preserver was not always like this, and was human, but Preserver says that it was better it was a Mechanite. It knows that it was not always in this form, but it doesn't remember who it was and how it came to be like this. It remembers the sky cracking as the walls came down, and the lancemen held back the tide of monstrosities and vegetation so that they could escape to the Undercity. It then says that it can help them find its history, as the Fulad throne is capable of taking special cylinders imprinted with memories and feeding them into the throne's occupant. They've already found some of these cylinders, so all Aram has to do is sit on the throne and have someone plug them in. All that is required is the Fist, an heirloom of the Imperial family that allows them to use the throne. The throne is one of the most mystical and powerful artifacts ever created, so the fist ensures that only those who were meant to sit on it could use it. Preserver had already given them the fist, the strange mechanical device that they didn't know what to do with. Preserver gave it to them so that they might learn the city's history and retell it to Preserver. The throne was immediately inspected afterwards, now humming with power thanks to the power grid being online. A port was found in the left armrest that would fit the cylinders, while the right contained a depressed section molded around the grip of the fist. Nussbaum isn't so sure about letting Aram sit in the throne and plug himself in, but Aram trusts Preserver and they don't have many options if they want to figure out what happened. They activate the throne, causing Aram's eyes to fill with a pale golden light, and his spine arches. He writhes wordlessly in the throne, gasping, and exclaims that he can see it. 
Nussbaum begins to call for them to shut down the power, but Aram shouts that he can handle it, as he continues to writhe before abruptly ceasing. He says that it's beautiful. He is standing on the palace balcony facing the eastern district as the sun is rising. He can see all of the buildings, although there's no skyscrapers, and the city is in perfect condition. The streets are bustling with activity, and all of the people have bionics of some sort. Suddenly he sees himself sitting in some sort of car, surrounded by guards carrying swords and some sort of primitive gun. The window is rolled down, and people are offering things to him. Bread, wine, fruits, and gifts. One is an oil painting of a man, and Aram realizes that it is Bumaro, and he has seen this through Bumaro's eyes. Half of his body is Fulad, and he's speaking in Mechanite, but he can't understand it. They're back in the palace, and he's on the throne, as soldiers and generals pour over a massive map of Asia. There's lines drawn everywhere, and there's three big circles, one in Egypt, one in India, and one on the Chinese coast. All of them are yelling and arguing, but he looks to his right and sees a beautiful woman wearing a golden mask, with an intricate set of golden, metal-feathered wings on her back. There's also a little boy next to her, and he realizes that this is Bumaro's wife and child. He turns back to the generals and nods, speaking in Mechanite, which is later translated as, The Covenant Go Too Far. Prepare the Golden Legion. The light then fades from Aram's eyes, and he slumps over unconscious, as medics are called. He was found to have a slightly elevated blood pressure and heartbeat, but was otherwise fine, expressing a closer interest in the archaeological team's findings in the following days. Another document recovered from the city is translated and provided for us, reading, And the sweep of the Golden Legion took three long centuries of expansion, as the Mechanite Empire's legates established beautiful, harmonious dominion on the oases and villages of the world. And as they expanded, they found relics, artifacts sheared from Mechane during their gods' fall from heaven, scattered over the earth, and with each relic carried back to Amani Ram, the fervor of the people grew and grew as their leaders rose, warred, and died for their heirs. And as the legion marched forward over those long centuries, two other nations of man marched. The Covenant of the Deva rode forth on their great, horrible spirit beasts, searing a path through the jungle from their twin city of Mamjul Karar. And they used their black magic to open a gap, stepping from one side of the continent to another, and those that went through established another city, Adatum that would after another two centuries fall to its own slaves, branding themselves the Nalka. And all these parties marched into Asia, only vaguely aware of the existence of the other two, until the Battle of Harumar, where they collided. The existence was an affront, the disgusting flesh beasts of the Nalka an insult to the steel glory of Mekane and the Covenant's plant spirits choking and infesting the gears and wheels of the Legion. And so the Legion fired the first mortar, shattering the Covenant's ranks, and thus began a war that would end with the destruction of Asia. The first war raged across the continent in every theater. Fleets of golden-hulled warships constructed in Omani Ram and pushed down river to encounter the Covenant in the bay. The Nalka raised an army of the dishonored dead from Adatum and marched them ceaselessly to throw themselves in the front line, choking the vines of the sorcerer Nawabs. There were no laws in war, and there was no honor in death. Every corpse was fodder for future battles. 
forests were scorched during retreat to deny the Covenant seed, and the warriors of the Nalka and Covenant chose to throw their weapons in the sea rather than surrender the precious metal to the foundries of the Legion. And the Colossi, great thousand-armed tall Goliaths of steel and bronze and foulade that rent the sky down upon the Nalkan hordes. Every second man was killed in the fighting, and it raged for three hundred years and would have gone on forever until the Abominate landed his ships on the western coast of Ethiopia and began his march to a money run. Devastation. So, as mentioned, this is a completely new canon related to the Church of the Broken God, the Sarkites, and the Davites. Their origins have always involved conflict, but here we're getting an intimate look at exactly how the Mechanites operated and waged war. This is a lot of technology to have simply disappeared over time, and it's clear that Preserver knows a bit more than he's letting on. Despite the relative peace and quiet that the Foundation has experienced so far in a money rom, there's an underlying sense of dread about the dead city. More of the city's secrets and its past will be revealed in part two, so stay tuned. SCP-001 Amani Ram Part 2 A city discovered in the desert contains relics from a past civilization. While that's a simple enough premise, one even grounded in reality, the discoveries that the Foundation has made in the lost city of Amani Ram are truly startling. The people that lived there, the Mechanites, were dealing with massive mechs and cold fusion reactors at a time when most of the world was just figuring out basic technology. Doctors Aram and Nussbaum were sent in to try and figure out what happened here and the extent of their technology, but as usual, the rabbit hole continues to get deeper. Let's continue. When we last left off, Dr. Robert Aram had just finished using the throne in the center of the city for the first time, allowing him to revisit memories from Emperor Bumaro's past. A week later, he volunteered to use the throne once more, citing his quick recovery and how much information they could glean from the past. Dr. Nussbaum and her team have figured out a rough chronology of the cylinders, so she wants to try and test one from roughly the middle to try and see if they can learn more about the Nalka and the Davites before the chaos of war. Aram says that he can't control what he sees, but Nussbaum suggests that he probably can, as the throne wouldn't be that useful if future generations couldn't specify what they wanted to learn. That being said, she has no idea how he can control it, so he's thrown in blind once again. The memory begins in a stone city in the desert, but it isn't a money rom. Aram deduces that it's along the Nile River, and that he's actually in the city of Thebes in Egypt. He's Bumaro once again, sitting at the head of a caravan of large, beetle-like automatons. They arrive in the city and meet with the pharaoh, whom they exchange gifts with. Soon they dismiss all of the servants, and the pharaoh asks Bumaro if he can expect his support against the Abominate. Bumaro responds that his army is already spread thin to enforce peace on his land, and he cannot afford to be involved in his affairs. The two begin to argue and shout, with the pharaoh stating that the Abominate is marching on a money rom. He will cut a swath through Egypt and stack their corpses to build a bridge across the Nile. Bumaro refuses to help and leaves, with Aram asking why the pharaoh doesn't understand, as there are bigger things at stake. The scene shifts to a different throne room, with Bumaro facing a man in a robe and turban, possibly Arab or Ottoman. The man shakes his head, and the scene shifts again to a tent facing a tribal chief. They're discussing establishing trade routes, selling the fulad, the technology, 
but the chief doesn't want to get involved with the war and risk the Nalka or the Covenant. The scene shifts again to a ruined city surrounded by a jungle on fire. The sun is setting, the smoke's thick in the air, and Bumaro is standing on a bluff in front of his soldiers. The soldiers are lobbing firebombs and mortars into the city and scaling the walls, with Aram commenting that the defenders look almost Indian. There's some kind of ghosts or spirits swirling in the air as well. The soldiers are bringing down the walls and slaughtering the enemy. He looks behind him to see the female general wearing dragon armor, and he gives her a nod. She proceeds to scream and charge down the bluff, the giant metal armor suit leading the charge as they shatter the enemy line. The general holds up her sword as lightning strikes it, and the battle becomes a massacre. Later, Umaro is in the city itself on his mount, surveying the ruins. He looks to the general and sees himself reflected in her helmet, no more than 25 years old. He sees survivors crawling across the dirt, and the general steps on one's head, causing some sort of flame spirit to burst out along with the man's brains. Nussbaum asks Aram to focus on a money Ram, and soon he's back there, standing in the palace. He sees that the city is militarized, with guards in the streets and turrets on the walls. He's speaking to an engineer, asking if Mekane's kiss is ready. The engineer feels confident about it, and the undercity has been retrofitted to fit all of the components. He then sees in the distance gigantic mechs, 200 feet tall, with four legs and two arms. He can see three of them, enforcing a perimeter around the city, and Aram says that this isn't a war, it's an apocalypse. Nussbaum says that it's probably time to take a break, so they unplug him from the throne. She then asks him when he learned to speak Mechanite and Egyptian, but he has no idea. Afterwards, research began to take a special priority on war records and weapons technology that may have been left behind. Over the course of the following weeks, records of manufacture and shipment for thousands of ammunition and supplies were translated, revealing a scale of war production previously considered impossible in antiquity and rivaling the war output of developed nations in the modern era. Additionally, the mentions of Mekane's kiss and it possibly being an extremely powerful superweapon incited a new flurry of research into the components and devices in the Undercity. One of the engineers investigating Mekane's kiss writes a memo to Dr. Aram discussing the findings. It reads, I understand you're recovering from extended experimentation with the throne. Not to disturb your rest, but the team thinks we've come up with a solid theory on what the device under the city, the Mekane's Kiss, is. Just some background context. Some of the geologists that came in during a second wave of personnel made some interesting but, at the time, irrelevant discoveries, amounting to the revelation that the sand within SCP-001 is of a slightly different chemical composition to the sand outside it. The sand inside is more similar to a kind of white sand found in a section of the Arabian Desert, several hundred miles the northeast. We didn't know what to make of it, but the recent research into the Undercity has changed things. We've mapped out the whole device. It occupies 65% of the Undercity's volume. Practically everything is connected to it that isn't stuff like the sewers. Its components have also become more understandable with our new experience on mechanite design architecture and philosophy. The technology is antiquated, but it's almost all paratech. Extremely powerful conduits, converters, connections, etc., all terminating in a small chamber emitting extremely high levels of radiation. We sent a protected probe in, warding it. It melted a few minutes later, but we ran the pictures and energy signals against the database and got… 
Nothing. We've never seen anything like it. But then, Tens decided to call in a few favors and run it against the GOC database. Apparently, they have seen something like it, and tried to weaponize it. A long-distance, large-scale matter D-slash-reconstructor and emitter. A gigantic teleporter, basically. Apparently big enough to move an entire city hundreds of kilometers. Mekane's kiss isn't a super weapon, it's a Hail Mary. Unfortunately, it's completely burned out. It'd require a team months to get it back into remotely working order, and that's ignoring the problem of power. It's way too demanding to pull from the city's power grid. We think it draws directly from the cold fusion reactors, which is another impossibility. Plus, we still don't know how it was controlled, or how any of the computation works without, well, computers. In any case, I don't think a money rom will be teleporting anywhere soon. We're then provided another translated document from the city, which reads, And in the sixtieth year of the war, as the fighting reached a crescendo, and Thamud burned with the shelling of the Legion on the flesh hordes of the Nalka, the Matriarch of the Covenant and the Grand Karsist Ion met under the shadow of night in the black catacombs of Aditum. And there they came to understand a truth. Bitter enemies, though they might be, the flesh of the Nalka and the plants of the Covenant were an extension of each other, both extrusions of the natural world. Evenly matched, neither could truly destroy the other. But the Mechanite, Blessed Steel, was something else. A gift from the sky, well capable of crushing each of them. But together, they stood a chance. And such it was, that as the invasion plans were drawn, and the great siege engines were constructed, and the pole arms cooled in the foundries, the Golden Legion marshaled and marched themselves, beginning the long, bloody trek to Aditum. And as they crossed through the desert of Asia, the Nalka were lending their forces to another invasion, this one raised by the Sorcerer Nawabs with the Deva against Amani Ram. A black, Wicked army, secretly gathering in the jungles of the south, marching on the suddenly vulnerable first Rom of the Mechanites. And with them came the Magics. The Nalka offered one of their greatest boons, a plague to infest the city. And the Covenant offered the Song of the Deva to make the verdant greenery of the desert rebel against its masters. And even then, their marshaled forces were not enough to dominate the Colossi and take the city. But in the far west, beyond the gate, another storm was brewing. The Abominate, may his name never be spoken of, stood on the shores of the coast as the damned fleet disembarked from their massive ships, and his army assembled itself from his prisoners and his soldiers, and the march to the east to Amani Ram began. The city settled between two unstoppable forces, neither aware of the other's presence, as the two armies pushed to the walls of the city and the head of its king, queen, and general. So, as the Mechanite army marched on Aditum, the capital city of the Sarkites, the newly formed coalition of the Sarkites and the Davites marched on a money rom. The Sarkites provided a plague to infest the city, which could very well have been SCP-610, or any other number of Sarkite anomalies, and the Davites provided some of their anomalous mastery over botany. They still couldn't take the city though, until the city was besieged on the other side by a separate force, led by the Abominate. Who or what the Abominate is remains to be seen, but their true name has been completely stricken from the record. Another meeting with O5-11 was scheduled to discuss the new discoveries, 
but the day before the meeting, an unidentified aircraft was detected near the city. The plane was radioed for identification as it approached, and it responded with valid Overwatch command credentials. It ended up landing, allowing 05-11 to disembark, accompanied by MTF Alpha-1, Red Right Hand. Nussbaum and Aram rushed to the city to greet him, surprised that he would make a personal visit to the city. Eleven says that he's heard so many great things about this city so far that he had to see it for himself. He admits that it does look a lot nicer now that they've started to rebuild it. Aram tells him that they've managed to get primary power back online, along with the train system and the climate control. They're working on getting the weaponry back online soon as well. 05-11 asks Nussbaum about the recent breakthroughs in relation to the throne, which Aram is the primary test subject for. Aram responds that they've done a dozen tests since they discovered it, while only a handful have turned up anything substantial. It's mostly fragmented memories from old kings, either the streets filled with citizens, or visions of battlefields. Nussbaum says that they've translated over a hundred tablets so far, but most are simple correspondence. The recent ones, however, have been far more interesting, and the group heads to Nussbaum's office to examine them. 0511 comments that he expected more of a sparse military setup here, but she seems quite comfortably set up. Since they've been here now for nearly a year, they've had plenty of time to settle in. Nussbaum says that they've made great strides recently in determining the fate of Amani Ram and the Mechanite culture at large, thanks to the translations, the throne, and some limited help from Preserver. It's been established that the Davites hail from the Indian subcontinent, and the Nalka are likely from Central or East Asia. The later records, however, mention a fourth party, the Abominate, and so far they know practically nothing about them, only that they possessed a fleet of seafaring vessels, and likely hailed from West Africa. 0511 finds it a little hard to believe that an army crossed the entire breadth of the Sahara 4,000 years ago, but it's hardly the strangest thing they've encountered here. Nussbaum also says that they have reason to believe that the Gobi Desert was a significant theater in the First War, suggesting that the three primary cultures had some experience warring in deserts. 0511 asks why they don't include the Abominate as one of the primary cultures, and Nussbaum says that they're not even sure if they're human yet, let alone a distinct culture group. The Aegean tablets that led them here didn't mention any fourth party in the First War, but some colleagues of hers researching the mundane Thamud culture in the Northwest recently unearthed a trove of tablets. They apparently detail a cataclysmic battle between four armies for control of a major city. They're hoping to have full translations ready within the month, but so far they believe that the Abominate was the main reason that the city itself fell, not the Nalka and Davite coalition. This worries 0511, but there's nothing they can do now but wait for the translations. Moving back to Aram, he says that they've discovered a lot of military weapons, ranging from pole arms and swords to what seem like primitive chainsaws, to long-range shoulder-mounted mortars and elephant guns. They've also found a few interesting things in the Undercity, such as a few suits of functional power armor, which enhance strength, speed, durability, power, and some of them are even flight capable, but none of them are usable without the mechanite implants to link to. A few days later though, Preserver directed them to another chamber in the Undercity, filled with assembly lines, industrial sections, and crates filled with mechanite implants. These implants included foulade and steel bionic arms, legs, prosthetics, torso cages, heads, and of course sensory implants, just like foundation ones. Aram wants to test them on some D-Class. 
0511 says that he cannot approve of outfitting D-Class with millennia-old cybernetics and putting them inside of highly destructive mech suits. Aram accepts this, but says that in the meantime, he'd like to see if the city's defensive systems still work, the mechs and gun emplacements. 0511 still doesn't trust the visions completely, and is wary of placing any faith in the technology here. If what Aram says is true though, there's at least two super weapons here that the Foundation could deeply benefit from, the Colossi and the Teleporter. Aram considers correcting 0511 and saying that the Teleporter isn't a super weapon, but instead says that he'll need plenty of supplies, as he wants to bring the cold fusion reactors online. This is a big request, and one that Eleven thinks is quite dangerous, as they still don't even know what destroyed the city, and they might end up blowing it up. Aram counters that they've already mastered most of the tech they've discovered, and they have Preserver to assist them. Discovering the city's defenses and how effective they are is crucial to getting an accurate image of the battle. Aram asks Nussbaum to back him up on this, and although she hesitates, she does support it. Eleven says that if both of them are in agreement, he can make it happen, but tells them to be safe and to not take any needless risks. Sometime later, Aram writes in his personal log, discussing their progress with the cold fusion reactors. It reads, Progress on rebuilding the cold fusion reactors is progressing much, much faster than projections. Normally I'd be worried, but I'm surprisingly calm. It's obvious. Our people are getting familiar with the technology. The Fulad foundries are operating at amazing efficiency. We've worked out how to mold and shape the metal just how we need it, and what last year looked like a bizarre, nonsensical circuit structure and design philosophy now strikes me as beautifully idiosyncratic. A snapshot into a bygone era. I've never really been one for history. More of a STEM type. I never looked down on those that pursued history, I just didn't see the attraction. Machines are in front of you, something tangible you can see and hear and touch and interact with. You can't do that with history. Not really. The Fulad throne, of course, has changed that. I've spent lifetimes of ancient emperors in minutes. It's staggering. The depth of emotion and personality you can feel from only a few choice minutes in someone's body. Their grief, pain, joy, their story. Fascinating stuff. The technology of the throne and any possible side effects remain elusive, but we've been testing it for a few weeks now, maybe a dozen times. And while I'm always tired after, not a surprise at my age, I feel fine otherwise. And now I know Mechanite, Greek, and Egyptian. Go figure. I've gotten a front seat view to the first war, and it is apocalyptic. There's really no other word for it. Gigantic mech suits crushing cities as the sky itself opens up. Spirit demons fighting alongside human compatriots. Metal soldiers charging walls. Insanity. A secret, bloody history the world doesn't even remember. But, as with all war, it's not quite so black and white. Being inside Bumaro's, or the various Bumaro's bodies, none of them were tyrants or dictators. Maybe autocrats, but what emperor wasn't. They all wanted to protect their people, to raise them to something beyond human. I can't help but sympathize. Nothing impresses onto you the fragility of your body than nearly losing it, but they understood that and actively improved themselves using the bionics and implants. Reach heaven, 
through transhumanism. Speaking of implants and bionics, the cache we discovered some weeks ago along with the Legion armor. 0511 denied D-Class testing. It's frustrating. We can't use the glorious technology here to improve the world, we can't use it to improve ourselves, we can barely use it to improve the damn city. It's devastating, and most of the team agrees with me that we should use it. So we did. I can't use D-Class to test the implants, but using myself is a different matter. The new arm is... Wonderful. It's smoother, more responsive, more sensitive and durable, and it doesn't even hurt at the end of the day. I can sleep with it on. 99% of our personnel in a money rom are already augmented, so changing out their stainless steel arm for a foulard one or something is no big deal. Why should five be the only one that reaps the gifts the mechanites left us? About a month later, Dr. Nussbaum and four members of the archaeological team were excavating a number of mosaics in the Undercity, progressing into an unstable section. The ceiling overhead suddenly gave way, with the archaeological team members escaping largely unharmed thanks to strength-enhancing bionic and cybernetic augments. Unfortunately, Nussbaum sustained severe internal and external injuries and was rushed into emergency surgery. Her injuries included a shattered collarbone, fractured spine, cranial injuries, and hemorrhaging, so her likelihood of survival was deemed extremely low. Dr. Aram proposed utilizing the mechanite augments to stabilize her and offer her a chance of survival, thanks to assistance from Preserver. The medical team agreed. And so after 29 hours, 17 pieces of mechanite technology were implanted across Dr. Nussbaum's body. When she finally awoke 32 hours later, she first whispered for water, and then said that she cannot see. She only remembers the ceiling collapsing, but asks if the archaeological team is okay. Aram says that they made it out fine, but she wasn't so lucky. She then says that she cannot feel her legs, or arms, and asks Aram what happened. He explains that she was going to die, so they replaced her shattered body with mechanite prosthetics. Her immune system integrated with them seamlessly, and it was like they came to life, working to repair the damage done. Nussbaum begins to hyperventilate and swear, asking if she looks like a monster now. Aram tries to calm her down, explaining that she would have died, and if she didn't, she would have laid here for three agonizing years to recover, eventually having to relearn how to walk, sit, breathe, all while in pain for the rest of her life. He understands how she feels, that she'll never be the same, but flesh is weak, and with her new body, she'll be on her feet in a week or less. She may not ever be the same, but she'll be better. He finishes by telling her to get some rest, and for what it's worth, he doesn't think she looks like a monster. The implants are works of art, with the spine support spread like a pair of wings, making her look like an angel. It ended up taking her two weeks to recover but her recovery provided the medical team plenty of insight into the enhancements offered by the mechanite augmentations. They integrated with her immune and nervous systems, offering fine, instinctual control and an increase in healing speed. Due to the relative lightness of the foulard material, her body mass did not considerably change, but her strength, lift capacity, running speed, pull weight, and a suite of other measurements vastly increased. She also reported significant increases in her sensory ability, well beyond that of her former foundation implants. 
Finally, the spinal brace and its external portion, a pair of retractable wings, allow her a limited but notable ability to glide on strong updrafts. She eventually declined an offer of a desk position, instead choosing to continue her work as the Amani Ram Project co-lead. Dr. Aram was reprimanded for his unauthorized use of potentially dangerous anomalous artifacts on both himself and a colleague, but he was not given disciplinary action. Part of this was due to Nussbaum's expressed gratitude to him, stating that if she had been conscious, she would have consented to the procedure. The two return to Preserver, who says that it witnessed her accident, and she has its sympathies, but it refers to her as Hedara, Emperor Bumaro's wife. She corrects it, and it pauses for a moment before apologizing. Preserver had helped save her life, and had actually seen the structural failure, but failed to warn her in time. It then refers to her as an impressive sight, as she is the first human it has seen with full augmentations, the way it used to be done. Its memories come closer to returning, and it remembers receiving its first augmentation, its left hand made of a polished red. Moving on, Nussbaum says that they have nearly exhausted the records and cylinders they've found, and they have not explained what happened to the city after it was marched on by the Nalka, the Davites, and the Abominate. They're hoping that Preserver is able to remember something about the event. Preserver actually does remember something, saying that it remembers gargantuan spirit beasts that dwarfed the Colossi and forced them back. It remembers catapults and trebuchets and great siege engines that pelted the buildings with strange glass projectiles. It remembers their confusion and the plague that swept through their ranks like a wildfire. It also remembers the abominate, lowering the great door to the city with a single spell, and it remembers donning its war armor and leading its liege and his family to safety. It also remembers failing. It has no face or identity to offer for the Abominate, just the name, but it sounds like a singularly powerful individual. Aram says that what happened was tragic, but it still doesn't tell them anything they don't already know. Preserver then opens up its left hand, revealing another cylinder, made of a rougher metal compared to the delicate ceramic of the others. It says that it has looked unto itself, the hundreds of cubits of inscribed steel and tubes that hold its soul. Its mind is spread across the entire Undercity, and in the deepest reaches of itself, it found a shrine. The shrine contained pieces of war armor, meticulously wrapped and preserved, and within them was this cylinder. The chamber had been sealed for centuries, and Preserver has forgotten why it was there, so they'll have to tell it. Nussbaum takes the cylinder and leaves with it, while Aram stays behind with Preserver. Official audio ceases at this point, but some scientific equipment in the area contained some microphones which picked up some more conversation. This audio was not recovered until several months later, by chance. Preserver tells Aram that he seeks the ability to command change, and he resents the limitation of his station. The Fulad throne was forged from the very first sheets of the metal shorn from Mekane's body, and it's more than a symbol of power. It is an instrument of power. It says that Aram has already noticed how his voice carries weight and how he commands attention. When Aram told Nussbaum to take the cylinder while he stayed behind, she didn't even protest, she simply followed his order. Preserver says that when the throne was forged at the dawn of the era, Bumaro's people bowed to it and spread forth across Asia like a gleaming sword. They laid down their lives for their lord, as the throne contains the power to dominate lesser minds. 
every time that Aram sits on it, he invokes the memories, the name, and the power of the kings of old. Aram asks why it's telling him this, and Preserver responds that surely he sees the parallel by now. Time is a flat circle, and it swallows its own tail like a sand serpent. He has seen Bumaro's memories, and he has seen Hadara's wings. Aram turns to leave, saying that this is ridiculous, but Preserver tells him that he seeks to change the world, to make it more accepting of people like himself and her. So did Bumaro. The voice of the Emperor is his now, so he shouldn't squander it. The following day, the team prepares to test the cylinder provided to them by Preserver. Nussbaum tells Aram, however, that she would like to handle this one, as she now has far more mechanite implants than Aram, and they may help her to see more. Aram isn't so sure, as they're an unexpected variable, and they could interact differently, but Nussbaum says that they won't know until they try. Aram still isn't convinced, and Nussbaum asks if he's alright, saying that he's acting strange. But he says it's fine, she can do it, but she should be safe. Nussbaum sits on the throne and activates the cylinder, reacting far less severely than Aram's first time. She says that she's standing on the walls of the city, along with hundreds of soldiers and gun turrets. She can feel herself barking out orders, and the soldiers are obeying, setting up siege engines, loading ammunition, evening out the wall. She is wearing elaborate armor, and says that she is not a Bumaro, but a woman, olive-skinned and small. She's the female general, and she sees a colossus in the distance, shaking the entire city with each step. It's heading towards the horizon, towards a horde of bodies, armor, banners, and mounts amidst a dust storm. The horde goes as far as the eye can see, and there's nothing they can do to stop their advance. The scene then shifts, showing the city on fire. The sky is red, choked with smog, and all she can hear is the clashing of steel and screaming. She's crouched behind a barricade, and she hears buildings collapsing and mortar fire. The enemy looks like beasts and monstrosities, great masses of flesh and limbs in a sickly pale purple, dragging themselves along. Spirits are in the air, and purple fire covers the walls. She can hear the beating of their drums, and their war chants, and cannon fire beyond the walls. She can just barely make out the colossi in the horizon through the smoke, and the streets are wet with blood and slime. Now she's standing over the ruins of a house, hit by a mortar. There's an object in the center, and when one of the men touched it, it broke open, and his face burst into leaves. There are vines spreading outward from him, creeping from his writhing corpse towards them, it's the petrified plant they found in the Undercity, a biological weapon. They retreat into the Undercity, with the Legion holding the entrances and choke points against the swarms. She's surrounded by death, and she splits a man open, chin to groin, followed by beheading one of the flesh beasts. Blood pools in the golden channels of her sword and splashes across her armor. Aram tells her to focus on the Emperor, and the scene changes to the palace as the city is shaking. The Legion is holding the palace against the Horde, as Bumaro sits on the throne. She tells him that they must leave, as the enemy has taken three of the gates, and they will not have a chance for much longer. Bumaro instead stands up, wearing his war armor, and says that she must go calling her Shahashna. It's a word they're not familiar with, but seems similar to the words for protect or guard. Bumaro says that she must go and activate the kiss, but the two begin to argue. 
She says that the kiss is dangerous, and that it has no control mechanism. Bumaro tells her that they have no other choice, and says that he commands it. She bows, and Bumaro says that he will go and seat himself in the courtyard, and this keep will not be breached while he draws breath. She then sees him sitting in the same spot as the statue they found, waiting with sword and spear in hand. Aram realizes that it's not a statue after all. Nussbaum then says that she has left the palace and is now running across the city to the nearest undercity entrance. Much of the horde has entered the city, and she slaughters as many as she can as she runs. She guts another beast, followed by crushing the skull of a covenant summoner. Finally she reaches the undercity, and seals the entrance behind her. It's different here, brightly lit and well signed, although blood plasters the walls and corpses line the passageways. She proceeds deeper and deeper into the labyrinth, encountering the plant virus and the mutated flesh pod tentacles, alive and throbbing. There are many of their soldiers moving through the Undercity, confused, and there are many families hiding out down here, but she cannot help them. She recognizes the route she's on, and realizes that she is progressing towards Preserver's Chamber under the palace. When she arrives, she finds only masses of machinery, with no preserver. The room hums with an unfamiliar energy, and there are automata everywhere, maintaining the machine. She seals the chamber behind her, and hears a boom from above, and she begins to strip off her armor. She realizes now what Shahashna means. It means one who guards, a preserver. She reaches out and touches the machinery, and suddenly Nussbaum's eyes begin to glow, and she writhes on the throne, her back arching wildly. When she stops, she says that when she touched the machine, she felt complete agony, like someone was cutting her limb from limb. Now she sees only rubble and debris, with no noise. She is now inhabiting one of the automata, and she emerges back onto the city streets. She finds everyone dead, with not a free patch of dirt to be found as corpses choke the streets. Dead bodies cover every possible surface, ranging from citizens, to mechanized soldiers, to the horde. Nussbaum asks, what has she done? And although Aram says that it's just a memory, she says that she destroyed the Empire, trying to save it. They cut the power to the throne, but nothing happens, until Aram pulls Nussbaum away from it. She thanks him and says that it was overwhelming, but it's no wonder that Preserver cannot remember, as she obliterated her own civilization while trying to save it. She had a taste of that feeling for just a few seconds, but it was too much while Preserver has lived with that guilt for nearly 3,000 years. Nussbaum guesses that Preserver placed her memories into the cylinder to get rid of them, but now she's forgotten why she did so in the first place. Further testing was temporarily halted until a decision could be made on whether or not to inform Preserver of her past. Aram writes a personal log discussing the decision. It reads, This is ridiculous. Preserver has been integral to the success of the Amani Ram initiative, far more so than any of the O5s arbitrating on whether she deserves to know her own identity. We wouldn't even have the throne if she hadn't led us to it and provided the fist, the cylinders, everything. We owe her. And even if we didn't, it's the right thing to do. Mad scientist is possibly one of the dumbest stereotypes of all time. Scientists have ethics. Even in Prometheus, where progress was done for the sake of progress, we had ethics. Expectations of behavior and morality. Making sure everyone knew exactly what they were signing up for. Not 
withholding crucial discoveries fundamental to their sense of being. The Foundation is not scientists, it is bureaucrats, and bureaucrats are the ones who will do away with ethics for efficiency. I shouldn't get this mad, but it just begs so many questions. It's representative of how they think of this project. Not a font of tools to improve the world, but of information that needs to be suppressed and released when the world is ready. Visionaries do not wait for the world to be ready to present their idea, because the world is never ready. We force the world to change. In the 60s, augments were a rarity in the Foundation. Agents who got them were freaks. They were a last resort to maintain functionality. Then they realized we were better, faster, smarter, stronger. And look at us now. A project and two sites staffed entirely by augmented personnel. But they obviously don't trust Preserver, because she's a machine. Even though she's not, really. She was human once, but they can only think of her as a machine, to use, to exploit. The same way they think of me, and Hedvig, and Tenz, and Zaid, and all the others. They don't trust us either. Not really. We've done more for them, and gotten fuck all in return, except the permission to rebuild what has been our home for nearly a year. It's frustrating. I've been thinking about what SCP-001-A1 said. About the throne. It's not true. There's no paratechnology that can force a psychic connection. That would require a staggering amount of power and all sorts of bullshit. But it makes me wonder. I've been probing Nussbaum, seeing if... She responds like Preserver said she would. I don't know whether I'm delusional or looking for what I want to see, but I feel like there's something there. She just agrees to whatever. If it is true, and I'm not saying it is, it would logically extend to the others, too. Did they all agree to swapping out their augments with the Mechanite ones because it was what they wanted? Or was it because it was what I wanted them to do? Eventually, the O5 Council decided to allow them to tell Preserver about her part in the siege itself, but to withhold the details of her activation of Mechane's kiss and the destruction of the city. Nussbaum and Aram head back to Preserver and tell her that they've witnessed the events contained in the cylinder. When Nussbaum says that she was the one to use the throne, Preserver remarks on it, but after a pause, says that it isn't a problem. Nussbaum says that they encountered the memories of a female general in the Legion, likely favored by Bumaro due to their close personal relationship. They tell her that they saw the city besieged by a united force of the Nalka and the Covenant of the Deva, as well as an appearance by the Abominant. The Mechanite Legion was away, marching on Aditum at the time, and so the Colossi and Home Army were not enough to defend the city. Preserver asks if she served her empire, and Aram says that she did, as she was instrumental in the defense of the city. He goes on to say that she tried to evacuate Bumaro and Hadara, but he sent her away on a different mission. Nussbaum is worried that he's going to ignore the O5 directive, but he tells Preserver that she was told to hold the North Gate at all costs to give the civilians a chance to escape the destruction. As the horde swept over the walls and slaughtered everything in their path, she held the gate against a thousand and thousand more sorcerers, and spirits, and flesh beasts, and she's the only reason that some people escaped the massacre. Preserver is shocked to hear that Mechanites still walk the earth today, and thanks Aram and Nussbaum for revealing this. We're then provided 
an email that was left unsent, written by Nussbaum to a colleague. In the email, she writes that she has some concerns about her project co-lead, Dr. Aram. She admits that he possesses a once-in-a-lifetime mind, but recent events have made her question his position, worrying that he has let his emotions compromise the integrity of the project. He made an unconsensual medical decision on her behalf. He's augmented himself with experimental technology, and utilized experimental anomalous technology to further research. He engaged in an argument with an O5, referred to a sapient anomaly by name, has spent long periods of time alone with this anomaly, has spent long periods of time alone with experimental technology attempting to deconstruct it, has focused research in strange directions averse to the goals of the project, and has demanded an additional level of dedication and respect from employees to the project and himself. As mentioned, the email was never sent, with only the draft found later. On the same day that this email was drafted, an audio file was recorded from a hidden recording device in Nussbaum's office. Aram had entered into her office at night, and muses how much Amani Ram looks like a proper city now. He had just been tinkering with the throne, based on some things the Preserver told him. There's some latent psychokinetic energy emanating from it that has been getting stronger with every use of the throne. He looks out the window at the city, saying that they've built something grand out here, and he's not sure how he's going to go back to bunking on site dormitories after this. He then tells her that he thinks they need to shift gears a bit, in terms of what they're focusing on here. They should begin focusing more on the weapons and technology used during the siege to figure out the enemy forces that attacked, and put the mundane archaeology aside for a little while. This upsets Nussbaum, who retorts that the mundane archaeology has already led them to breakthroughs on the technology and her work is just as important as his. He agrees, but she doesn't believe him, stating that he only sees the history and culture as a means to an end, and cannot understand why someone would want to study it for its own sake. Despite his claims that he respects her and her work, she continues, wondering why he feels he can come in here and tell her what her team should focus on, and why he thinks he can make decisions about her body for her. He doesn't regret saving her life though, and says that this argument is obviously about something bigger. She doesn't dispute that she's thankful for saving her from dying, but she doesn't owe him anything. Aram responds that he's the leader here, so everyone here owes him. If it wasn't for him, this project would have been shuttered months ago. Everyone else here looks up to him for the risks he's taken, so why doesn't she? Nussbaum says that they are friends, and she doesn't look up to friends, they are equals. Aram's voice suddenly changes and booms out stating that kings don't have equals. He continues by saying that her work has been secondary, and she is secondary. The purpose of the initiative was to find the technology of the Mechanites, and their history was ancillary. They have a living archive of their history now, so the directive of the project has changed. Nussbaum hazily asks what's happening, seeming to be semi-conscious, and Aram tells her not to resist him. She felt its presence when she sat on the throne, as they have now drawn the attention of something larger than them. Its eyes have settled onto them for the past year, but now they have its name, the Abominate. Nussbaum, on the verge of tears, tells him that he's scaring her. He responds that she should be more scared of other things, like that unsent email on her laptop. He tells her not to ask how he knows, 
as it's not her place, but she should delete it. After a short pause, he booms out again that she should delete it, and the sound of a keyboard is heard. Afterwards, he says that she has played the role quite well, but she feels it watching them too. She admits that she felt something, and he says that there are bigger things at stake now, and she will obey him. Sometime later, Aram meets privately with Preserver, who says that she can sense that he has used the voice, a booming command that demands obedience. Aram says that even if he has, he hasn't made anyone do anything that they wouldn't have done anyway. Preserver says that she makes no judgment, as this was not an unintended result. She asks him what he's used it for, and he says that he's just explored the limits of it to see how it works. Preserver knows that he came here to discuss something else though, and Aram asks if Hadara loved Umaro. Preserver says that of course she did, and she was his most favored wife, mother of his heir. She was pure, rising above the horizon with the sun, and she attended to him until he was unable to speak, or breathe, or eat. When he faded, she called upon his wisdom while her son grew into the throne. Preserver asks him if he has made her his queen, and he supposes so, although he wouldn't use the word queen. Preserver wonders why not, as surely he can see the parallels, that time is a flat circle. Aram says that he is not a king, but Preserver says neither was Bumaro until he was given a city of people that needed guidance. They were simple farmers before, but Mekane's arrival turned them into a king and queen, their home into a bastion, and their kin into the pinnacle of humanity. The people of Amani Ram were not different because of the augmentations, but instead they chose to be different and chose to elevate themselves because they were dissatisfied with the way things were. Dissatisfaction is the mother of ambition, and the coal that fuels the fire. There is no shame in dissatisfaction with this form, and we should strive to improve ourselves, as the flesh is weak. They improve Mekane by collecting her component parts scattered to the winds, and they improve their bodies by replacing their frail limbs and senses. In doing both, they improve their souls, and in this way, they do not change the world around them, but improve it. Aram then admits that he lied to Preserver, but she says that she already knew. She served her liege honorably for a lifetime and more, and she can see his face in Aram's. She can see the lines of worry, and knows that he was holding back the truth. She did not save this city. Aram says that Bumaro told her to go and activate Mekane's kiss, but she says that's impossible, as it was unfinished and would have destroyed the city. Aram says that the city was destroyed, but she says that she couldn't have activated it as there was no control interface. Aram tells her that Bumaro gave her something, a blessing, that she drank and touched the machinery, fusing with it somehow. She became the control mechanism and fired it, teleporting the city from the Sinai to the Arabian Desert, killing everyone inside of it in the process. Preserver falls silent for several moments, and eventually says that with her metal mind, she should be able to process anything, but not this. She was a general of the Golden Legion, and she damned her city and her people. She says that she is at the center of her own hell, but Aram's voice suddenly booms out again, telling her to listen. He tells her that she failed, and could not save the city, and because of her, it collapsed into devastation and disrepair, 
disappointing her once and future masters. But it's not too late, and they can still fix it and bring back a money rom. He asks her what she's prepared to give up, and after a slight pause, she responds with everything. Sometime later, another update meeting was scheduled with 0511 following a general decrease in quantity of technology and archaeological reports being transmitted. 0511 comes to Aram's office and tells him that he's worried about the pace of reporting from both him and Nussbaum. He's starting to think that the project has run its natural course, but Aram argues that there's still so much more to decipher here about their history and culture. 0511 wonders why he's suddenly interested in those things, and says that it's always been about the technology here. Aram has done his job phenomenally, and they've had Foundation researchers poring over every report to see how they can put it into practice. Aram says that that's just the Foundation, but 0511 says that they have a responsibility to maintain normalcy. They already have people in India and China looking around for the locations of the other two cities, and it's time to move on from a money rom. The personnel here will be reassigned to any project of their choosing with glowing recommendations, but Aram asks what if they'd rather stay here, as many won't want to leave. Eleven says that he can't presume to speak for everyone, but Aram says that he's their leader, and they look up to him. Eleven tells him that either way, they won't have much say in the matter, and the rest of the council agrees with him. Aram, however, says no, he's not going, as a money Ram was lost once because of people who didn't understand what it had to offer, and he's not going to let that happen again. He's not some dog that the council can shove around from project to project. 0511 asks if he's forgotten who he's talking to, as he can have him terminated, but Aram says that maybe that's true out there, but not here, in his city. The bodyguards with 0511 raise their rifles at Aram, but he uses his booming voice to command them to lower their weapons which they do. He says that a money rom has far too much to offer to throw it away, used and spent. He commands 0511 to go to the council and tell them that the project will continue. Eleven simply responds that he has an inch thick telekill plate in his cranium, which prevents any sort of psychic influence, and orders his guards to kill him. As the guards raise their guns again, they are each shot in the back of the head by a number of cloaked soldiers, the tactical response team that are now utilizing mechanite technology. Eleven says that Aram can't kill him without signing his own death warrant, but Aram responds that he's not going to kill him, as he's not a monster. Instead, Nussbaum descends from above wearing the intricate war armor as seen in the visions, and she glides down to a soft landing, wielding a curved golden sword. Aram tells her to take 0511 and toss him out of the city, to let him run back to the council. Eleven says that he's insane, as no one can take on the foundation and win. Aram says that he's not a supervillain. He has no interest in destroying the Foundation. He's just an engineer that sees a problem on the horizon. He needs to act before the Foundation gets all of them killed. With that, Nussbaum grabs Eleven and flies him out of the city. An Overwatch Command emergency session was called to address the events in a money rom and they took to vote on whether or not to scramble several task forces in the region and use military force to regain control of the city. Nine of the thirteen council members voted yes on the issue, with even the administrator of the foundation chiming in to agree as well. A task force consisting of three MTFs, 
Nine-Tailed Fox, Hammer Down, and the Mole Rats were sent in, totaling 83 personnel equipped with small and heavy arms and in armored personnel carriers. At the entrance to the city, they find a curved sword impaled into the sand, with one member commenting that Aram is not very subtle. Suddenly, Aram's voice comes over their radios, telling them to stay back, and that they're on the same side. Overwatch Command tells them to continue, however, and they see a number of figures standing along the massive walls of the city. Several more figures are flying overhead, dipping and swerving through the air. Aram's voice then booms on their radios, commanding the MTFs to hear him. They all become dazed momentarily, and Aram says that he made a mistake with 0511, and he's learned since then. The MTFs change the frequencies of their radios and cut Aram off, continuing forward towards the city. The figures on the walls can now be seen to be armed with a mixture of swords, pole arms, and long-range rifle-like weapons, all pointed at the advancing force. The MTF tells Command that these are unfavorable conditions for a firefight, but they continue forward. Aram's voice is heard again, mixed with static, and he explains that they found another cylinder after Eleven was kicked out, inside of the statue's hands. It's Bumaro's last testament, and he begs them to stand down, as they don't understand the threat of the Abominate. It's not a person, it's a force of nature, like a hurricane. They cannot fight it, and they need him. The MTF tells him that they'll place him and Nussbaum into custody, and then they can plead their case to the council. Aram says that bureaucrats never listen to the visionaries, and when the MTF gives Aram one last chance to stand down, he refuses. At that point, two dozen figures crest the sand dune from the other side, three to four meters tall in hulking golden exosuits of plated armor. The two in the middle are the largest, with one being intricately designed, piloted by Aram and another appearing to be made of stone, holding a sword and spear. Aram says that they might not listen to reason, but they will not stop him from changing the world and saving it. When this is over, they will beg him for his help. Cannon fire begins to rain down on the MTFs as they dive for cover and return fire at the warsuits. The war suits use a mix of brute strength and oversized ranged weaponry to break the MTF's line, although automatic cannons from the APCs have considerable effect on destroying the war suits. The reactor cores from the fallen units eject, however, causing miniature explosions. Aram booms out at his soldiers to not fail their king but gradually the superior maneuverability of the MTFs begins to turn the tide. They lose some personnel in the process, but manage to wreck or disable a similar number of the warsuits. Overhead, a number of the flying mechanites begin to dive bomb the soldiers, grabbing them and pulling them into the air. Moments later, however, an anti-aircraft emplacement begins firing, sending a number of the flying units crashing to the ground. Nussbaum is one of the flying individuals, however, and proves to be considerably faster and more evasive than the others. Aram orders her to pull back and go ensure that Preserver is ready. She rockets away from the scene at extremely high speeds, as Aram picks up a portion of a destroyed warsuit and heaves it at an anti-aircraft emplacement crushing it and its operator. The rest of the warsuits begin to pull back towards the city. The MTFs continue to fire on them, but then the ground begins to shake under their feet. Aram commands the Colossus to hear him and to defend its city. Suddenly a massive hand reaches out of the sand, followed by another, with its fingers wrapping around the wall of the city. A metal golem 
easily a hundred meters tall and covered in auto turrets, drags itself out of the sand and turns to face the Foundation soldiers. The MTFs immediately begin to panic, and Overwatch Command orders a tactical retreat, telling them that heavy armament and air support has been scrambled and is waiting outside of the entrance to the reality bubble. The Colossus, however, takes a single step and crushes a number of both Foundation and Mechanite personnel. Several buildings in the city shake from the impact, and Aram raises his sword to the sky, saying that this is how it should be. Nussbaum then reappears, perching herself on Aram's shoulder, and tells him that they are ready. The Colossus continues to move towards the Foundation personnel, who fire rockets and machine guns at it, to no effect. Aram comes in again over their radios, and says that they didn't accept his help. They used and threw away this city, but Aram saw something beautiful in it, and brought it all back to life. He will protect the world from the Abominate on his own terms, as the Foundation is a relic. If the human race is to survive what is to come, they will need to adapt, to change, and to improve. He says that his name is Robert Bumaro, and the world will change for the Church of the Broken God, because it has no choice. Following this, a massive power surge fried the electronics of a waiting aircraft three kilometers away. All communication in and out of the reality bubble ceased, and subsequent investigation indicates that the reality bubble no longer exists in the South Arabian desert. It's theorized that they activated Mekane's kiss, teleporting the city elsewhere. Overall, the events in Amani Ram have resulted in the Foundation raising their global threat level, now at a point where there's considerable potential to disrupt the general population. Foundation policy regarding digital and paratechnological implants and equipment has been frozen, pending further review by Overwatch Command. The Church of the Broken God has been designated as a group of interest, and all efforts are to be made to locate Robert Aram slash Bumaro and Hedvig Nuspa and bring them into custody. Laboratory samples of Davite, Nalkin, and Mechanite biological weapons used in the siege of the city have produced some viable specimens, and have been given provisional SCP designations. These include SCP-610, the flesh that hates, SCP-217, the clockwork virus, and SCP-697, a chemical capable of changing almost any type of solid matter into plant-like organisms. Project Forerunner Triad has been organized to address the consequences of the Amani Ram initiative, and report directly to the Council. Ascertaining the locations of the Nalka and Davide capital cities, as well as the identity and nature of the entity known as the Abominate, have all been elevated to global priority level Alpha. The Church of the Broken God has been presented in a number of different ways since their initial conception. They have been seen as mysterious enemies to the Foundation that want to convert the whole world to machines, and on the flip side as unlikely allies that want to save the world from the monstrous threat of Sarcasism. Amani Ram presents us a Church of the Broken God that's somewhere in between, I think with them wanting to be on the same side as the Foundation to fight off a greater foe, but also not seeing eye to eye with them. The initial inclusion of a new threat, separate from the Sarkites and the Davites, makes this canon even more unique, and time will tell on what exactly the Abominate is. The most fascinating part about this article, however, is the transformation of Robert Aram into Robert Bumaro a figure that's long been associated with running the Church of the Broken God. While it remains to be seen on how exactly good he is, he does at least seem to be earnest in his interests of protecting the people of Amani Ram and defending the world from the Abominate. We are likely going to see more material in this canon, but even on its own, 
It's a fine reboot of the Mechanites and the Broken Church.